I'm going to move through this next section about some of the wetland restoration techniques we've used at um, three state parks in Pennsylvania, but I am going to move pretty quickly um, just because of we're trying to do, a, I think, a, a three hour <laughs> presentation in an hour and a half. So uh, just bear with me, but I will direct you to some resources that you can investigate uh, further on your own time. So. Uh, to get started, there's just some preliminary considerations when you're getting um, into ins your actual restoration. Uh, things like digging a soil test pit to determine, you know, what are the techniques that you can use? Is clay present in the soil or is it available elsewhere? Or do you need to, would you need to bring some in? Um, what is the drainage of the restoration site? What are the water sources for the wetland? Is it surface water overflow or is it groundwater? Um, look at your slope. These, this is an important um, feature of, you know, the topography of the, the wetland itself. And if you need to, um, you know, be able to understand where water is coming in and out. And you need to determine your, the needs of the heavy equipment access. How are you going to get it into your site? And this is part of your permitting process also. And just any other considerations like where are hiking trails, um, other infrastructure, you know, buried um, utilities, other wetlands, other things you need to think about. Uh, I just wanted to highlight um, these books by Tom Biebighauser, who we've mentioned before is a wetland restoration expert we've worked with a number of times. And he has these nice, really nice books that go into uh, great detail about, you know, the technical steps of doing wetland restorations like the ones we're talking about here. And also, I want to direct you to, um, again, to our Pennsylvania uh, Vernal Pools website, where we have the resources section. And in that section, we have um, some documents you can download that describe some of the restoration techniques that we used. And as I go quickly through these first three techniques, I'm just going to show you the posters that we developed. And you can go back and download these posters and look at the steps in detail. Or better yet, uh, you can go to, to the Kings Gap Environmental Education Center to the, the forest pool trail at the base of the mountain there and, and walk the trail and see some of these restoration sites and um, kiosks for yourself. So the first technique that we used at King's Gap um, was a groundwater technique. And this is for sites with a seasonally high water table. It's a it's really a pretty simple technique. It just involves deepening the basin until it can be connected to the water table. And of course, your water table is fluctuating also with the season. So you need to be certain that the water table is high enough to connect to your basin um, through the period of time you want the basin to hold water. So for vernal pools, that's generally into July. Uh, you do not need clay soils in this type of restoration habitat because the depression is just directly connecting to a high water table. So you're not trying to hold the water there with an impermeable layer. Um, the, the, this is a, just a simple cross-section drawing showing um, the topography of a typical vernal pool restoration in a sort of an idealized version of what we are trying to achieve. Uh, we don't want a pool that is too deep or with a uniform depth. We want to have a mix of shallow areas and deeper areas. Uh, the deepest pockets in this pool were designed to be just 12 to 18 inches deep. And the overall basin has gently sloping edges. So here's the um, groundwater technique poster. And Again, you can you can get a copy of this from our website. You can go out to Kings Gap and see this uh, poster next to uh, one of well two pools actually that we restored using this technique. And um, you know prior to restoration, you know we used a soil auger to um, remove a plug of soil, and that's where how we found the high water table was right there below the surface. Um, you know we used. Uh, just your basic construction level survey rod and tape measure to measure things like you know, your target basin length, width and, width and depth before and after restoration, and to kind of calculate how much soil removal you would need to do to be able to expose that water table and increase that springtime flooding period. 
Um, prior to construction, the uh, vegetation, leaf litter, and topsoil was removed from the basin and reserved. And then we did the work in the basin to lower the profile of the basin. Um, we had an excavator with a 40 inch bucket that removed 16 to 19 inches of mineral soil from each basin. Um, and then that excess mineral soil from each basin was spread out, not compacted, but just spread out nearby in a flat upland to avoid erosion back into our deepened basin. And then the excess soil where we spread that excess soil was seeded with wheat and covered with cream straw for you know, erosion control. And once the basin, um, our restored basin was a nice bowl shape with the gradually sloping sides, the excavator took that reserved topsoil and the leaves um, that we had sort of peeled off the very top of, of the basin before we started work, that was put back into the, into the deepened basin. And so that's to restore all that, you know, we talked about the, um, the there's always life in that pool, pool basin. Um, even if it's one that wasn't working that well, there was probably some insect um, eggs and things. So we're putting those back in there so they can colonize the, the new pool. And the excavator, um, before it was finished in that pool, it didn't leave a nice smooth um, surface like you might want, you know, in your, your yard. <laughs> We want rough soils, loosened soils that they allow um, air and water to mix into the soil and creates microtop topography in the pool basin. And um, that's that's basically the process um, for th th that process. You would do at pretty much any restoration site where you're going to do that rough and loosen of the soils and also add back in things like large pieces of, of woody material. Um, those big chunks of wood are really important sources of, um, you know, structure and, and shelter um, and shade inside the pool basin. So for the groundwater technique, uh, we found that this was very successful at Kings Gap. Uh, the, both the sites that we uh, treated this way responded very well. Uh, Pre-restoration, we didn't have any vernal pool amphibians using the site. Post-restoration, we had all sorts, so it, that worked well. Uh, we used another technique, the synthetic liner technique. Uh, this we used at sites that didn't have any naturally occurring clay soils, and they also lacked a high water table. And it basically just uses um, an aqua-safe synthetic uh, liner to create a subsurface impermeable layer to keep water ponded on the surface. So we did this, use this technique at four pools at King's Gap, and it was also the technique, as Joanne mentioned, at the Bellacre um, Borough Project site. And, um, you know, the, the key thing here, it's similar to, you know, you're going to deepen the basin, shape it, put down your, um, your liner, which is actually sandwiched between two layers of geotextile fabric which will protect that plastic liner from getting punctured inadvertently. Uh, you have to be really careful not to drive your construction equipment over it so that you don't puncture it. And then you have to, you know, nail it down all around the edges and then cover it back up um, to sort of settle it in. So this technique, um, we found that it did increase um, habitat suitability for vernal pool amphibians. Where prior to restoration, this this upper left picture is actually that site I mentioned that was um, a, an illegal dump site. So after that, all that material was taken out. Um, this is a site where we put in an artificial liner, and this was actually ended up being the most successful of our four artificial liner sites at Kings Gap. If you look at the back side of this fernal pool, you'll see there's a fairly steep slope coming into it, and what that did was um, sent whenever you have heavier rain fall events, a lot of rain would kind of um, surface water would flow down that slope and through this pool basin and it would kind of flush flush it out a little bit, not like wipe it out completely, but it would sort of help carry out some of the, the leaves that were accumulating there, which is different a different situation than what we were having with the other three liner pools where we discovered a problem with them not drying down the way we expected them to. So at least in this situation at King's Gap where we had very pretty small liner pools installed under dense canopy 
where we were basically, you know, they were under heavy shade and we had severed any connection between tree roots and the pool basin. There was just not enough evapotranspiration apparently to dry these things down. So the water was just sitting in there, leaves would blow in and get trapped. And since the pools didn't dry down, the leaves just kept accumulating and accumulating. They were slow to break down. So the pools just became choked with leaves. Uh, we had a couple of volunteers, uh, Kathy King and Mike Bertram, uh, for 13 years. <laughs> they they have been monitoring these pools. But about five years in, they were like, you know, these pools just, they just don't look good. You know, there's some stuff trying to use them, but there's just not enough like open water for them. So they began raking out some of the excessive leaves out of the pool basins. And then by 2018, we're like, yeah, we, we really got to try and do something about this. They're just not doing what we wanted to do. So um, this photo shows with, with the landowner permission, um, Kathy and Mike and, and with our support, they, they went in there and they cut a four inch diameter hole in the bottom of the liner, which we worked so hard not to puncture before. Well, now we're putting a hole in it to try and increase the drainage. But this four inch hole basically did nothing to change the hydrology. So we haven't gotten it right yet, but we're gonna keep trying. So um, basically, uh, it, it was successful to a degree, but, but not quite where we want it to be. Um, and then for this last technique, we worked with soils. Uh, we worked in a site that had soils high and naturally occurring clay and silt. So we were able to use deposits of clay, um, redistribute them in the pool basin, you know, the deepened basin to create a subsurface clay lens to keep water ponded on the surface. And this technique is often used in conjunction with a groundwater dam. And since I see, see that we're running short on time, of course, I'm just going to show you, we do have a poster on this technique. And it was successful um, in increasing our hydro period and getting vernal pool indicators. Um, and just for comparison, and uh, I wanted to show you, we had a couple of control pools, um, both at Kings Gap and at Gifford Pinchot, where we just let conditions be, we didn't do any work. Um, and I think this is just important as to be able to have a comparison to your restored sites. So um, in conjunction with using clay soils to create basically a, a clay lens in the bottom of a wetland, a lot of times you might also need to block water from leaving the site laterally. And that just like every water is always trying to go downslope and there's always a downslope end to your pool and the water is going to try and go out that way. And if, if there's enough water leaving your wetland on that end, it could keep the water um, from, from filling the way you want it to. So sometimes um, this groundwater dam technique helps to block that water leaving your wetland and increase the hydro period. And we use this at a number of sites in a number of different scenarios. Um, but I'm just going to kind of fast forward here to a video we have where um, we're installing a groundwater dam on a, it's on a stream restoration site, but it's the same technique you can use in, in um, vernal pool wetland restorations. It's just a very useful um, and um, adaptive technique that you can use in a variety of uh, restoration settings. So I'm going to go ahead and play this for you. We're building a groundwater dam. The groundwater dam is designed to cut off flow in the filled ditch. The stream was diverted a number of years ago and it was placed into a ditch. We are now filling the ditch with soil. However, if we just filled the ditch with soil, water would continue to flow in the bottom of the filled ditch through the organic layers and it would also follow the gravel and sand that's been deposited in the bottom of the ditch over the years. When a person looks at a stream, we see water flowing, not recognizing that two thirds of the flow of water is really below the surface in the gravels and the sands. So this uh, groundwater dam that we're installing involves the, first of all, digging of a core trench. You see that a trench has been dug perpendicular to the ditch and it crosses the 100 floodplain of the ditch and the base of the core trench that we have dug is an impermeable layer of rock and we could determine we determine this because water was puddling on top of this uh, base layer 
So when you dig a core trench, you want to be close to the excavator operator and watch as they're digging. And you'll see as they're digging perpendicular to the ditch, they'll go through, first of all, plant material, then they'll go through the uh, organic layer, and then they'll go through layers of sand and gravel, and then you'll hit something hard, and it's that hard pan or that bedrock layer that the water is following. And after you intercept and cut through all those permeable layers, find soil that's high in clay, place it in the core trench. And we place it in the core trench in layers no thicker than six inches. And then we compact the soil uh, in each layer of soil that's placed in the core trench. And what we do is we build up that compacted soil to equal the original bank height on either side of the ditch. And this will successfully block water following the ditch underground. It will return the elevation of groundwater on the floodplain to historic levels. I've used this technique to repair farm ponds and wetlands that have not held water for 50 years. And we've also used this technique to saturate the soils in entire valleys, uh, returning groundwater elevations to historic levels. So we used this groundwater tech, uh, groundwater dam technique at a vernal pool uh, at Gifford Pinchot State Park. Uh, here's the original basin prior to construction two years before. Here we are during construction, repairing the outlet ditch with a groundwater dam. Here's the pool one month post construction. Here it is one year post construction. And here it is last fall, six years post construction. And this site responded really beautifully, both hydro hydrologically and with the plant and wildlife species present. Uh, so it is a very effective technique at most of the sites where we've used it um, and where you have enough clay on site to create your clay lands and groundwater dam. But if you don't have enough clay or it seems to be borderline in quality or amount, um, you could truck in clay, but that's going to really increase your project expense and complexity. Your lower cost alternative might be to improve, uh, bring in a bentonite liner to um, sort of shore up your groundwater dam. And I'm going to hand it over to Jack to talk about using a bentonite clay liner. Thanks, Betsy. We just wanted to touch on this project at Ohio Pile State Park because it offers a unique solution to areas where constructing a groundwater dam isn't feasible. So this is a small remnant farm pond at Ohio Pile State Park. It's interesting because Ohio Pile is mainly mountainous and there's not a whole lot of open water features in the park. This particular feature is really close to the campground and visitors enjoy it and also our, the park education staff uses this as an outdoor classroom. And there's a lot of frog and turtle species that utilize this pond. So it's very valuable to them and it's a feature they wanted to keep. Unfortunately, it was losing a lot of water through the embankment just with steeping uh, through the embankment itself. Water was finding its way through the mature trees and the root system. Another issue was that there was no way to dewater the pond. The, the only outflow, so to speak, is the horizontal pipe that you can see through the embankment that during wet periods, especially after snow melt, allowed water to rise to the level of the pipe, flow through it, and then cascade down the other side of the earthen embankment, which is, is not a good situation to have that running water on an earthen dam. So as we were at the park doing our wetland restoration project and planning it, they asked us to take a look to see, is there something we could do in conjunction with our wetland restoration project to also repair the small frog pond. And it was being funded by DCNR money from the park. So to help with that smaller budget, it would help if we could do it in conjunction with our wetland restoration because the equipment would already be on site. So a couple limitations with repair, the embankment having been built a long time ago was really narrow and steep on the downslope side, there were existing wetlands, and we really didn't want to, you know, of course, impact those wetlands downstream. And it really wasn't feasible to rebuild the dam entirely. A, it would take a lot of money and material to 
to truck that in, a lot of equipment cost and time to excavate the dam and rebuild it. But also that would entail totally dewatering the pond for a period and interrupting the life stages of all the aquatic life in the pond. So if we go to the next slide, what we ended up using was a clay infused mat, like a, a bentonite liner. And we were able to open up a trench across the dam, find the original ground surface, install this bentonite clay curtain, and then backfill and compact it. And if we go to the next slide, when it was all said and done, we were able to do that work on the existing footprint of the embankment. We didn't impact wetlands on the downslope side. While we were at it, we removed the horizontal pipe, which was a, a problem with erosion. And on the back side of the pond, it's it's not real evident in this picture because it was taken, taken right after construction and everything's matted. But where the cursor is right now, we created an, a spillway that runs across the natural ground slope. So it's wide, it's a relatively low slope, and we seeded that with wetland vegetation. And that's become a really nice diverse wetland seep that we've observed wood frogs uh, egg masses in over time. So again, just wanted to quickly illustrate, even though this is a, a permanent pond feature, we wanted to add this in to illustrate that bentonite curtain technique. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joanne and Joanne's gonna detail the main component of our Ohio Pile Restoration Project, which is a really interesting case study that marries infrastructure removal with wetland reestablishment. Thanks, Jack. Um, I'll try to do this fairly quickly since we're running a little behind here. Um, so this was our most recent project, um, our most complicated and uh, our most expensive project. Um, and it was located in Ohio Powell State Park at the Presley Ridge Wilderness School for Youth, um, which had run for about 30 years and then closed in 2008 and was um, purchased by um, WPC and turned over to Ohio Powell State Park. So this project involved removal of old infrastructure from that school, including a large concrete swimming pool in order to restore spring-fed seepage wetland. You can see um, an aerial photograph on the right that the swimming pool was already in place in the early 90s. So this is from 1995. Um, in addition to the pool, we had a stream restoration component and two other wetland repairs, one of which was the frog pond that Jack just talked about. So this project cost us 115,000 total for all of the pieces of the project and the swimming pool project was around 35,000 on its own. Um, for this project we used um, uh, Barron Environmental and Wetland Restoration and Training, Tom B. Becauser, who you've heard his name before, as our experts and we partnered along with DCNR State Parks. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this swimming pool project specifically. Um, next, Betsy. So the project met all of our selection criteria. We um, we had a safety hazard here with this part with this pool. Um, when it was full, the lower end of the pool was eight feet deep, and when it was dry, there was a nine foot drop to a cement bottom. So it was something the park was interested in having removed. Um, we knew from earlier surveys that the heritage staff had done in the park that vernal pool amphibians were using degraded habitats like road ruts for breeding. And there was a general lack of some good quality vernal pool habitats in the park. We found a spring house nearby the pool. So we are pretty sure that there was some natural spring fed habitat in the area at one time. There are other springs throughout the park that have created some natural habitat. Um, we do not know the extent of it at this site, but we're pretty sure that there was something there before it was channeled and piped. Um, we also found some amphibians using the pool as it existed. These were red spotted newts and green frogs. And we knew there were other amphibians in the area. Um, the amphibians using the pool were the ones who were most likely to use a more permanent pool. Um, and not necessarily the, the vernal pool amphibians we were targeting. But still, this had the makings of a good restoration project. Next. 
So we started our pre-surveys in 2018, um, the three of us along with Tom B, um, who ended up doing our restoration plan for us, visited. And what we found was this large concrete swimming pool, about a quarter acre in size. Um, the depth of the concrete was unknown, but we found out later it was quite thick. Um, we already knew it was built, as I said, in the mid 90s. There is a large um, dam at the lower end of the pool um, that's about 16 feet wide at the top. And a concrete spillway off to the west that exited to a spring fed channel. We did not see cracks or damage in the cement, so we know this was a very well built structure. Um, we also found um, sand along the east side of the pool where they had um, brought, brought it in to create a beach. So we were able to utilize that for another um, piece of the project. Next. So the way they brought water into the pool was, um, you can see the swimming pool outlined in purple there. And uh, the, the um, water was piped in from two different locations. To the left of the pool, you'll see where the spring fed channel was running and they piped that using a two inch diameter pipe to this little um, bubbler that's up in the center of the slide here that um, sprinkled out and then drained down into the pool. Um, also, they, there was a four inch pipe that they ran from the Long Run Creek, which is off to the right of the pool in this image. And that was piped into the pool as well um, from quite a distance. So they, they did a lot of piping in this, this pool and we found lots more buried pipes when we started to remove it. Next. So we had two main project goals for the project. Um, one was um, to provide for public safety and to reduce maintenance um, needed from park staff. The second was to restore the area to more natural habitats. So we wanted to create a fishless vernal pool type habitat for amphibians and invertebrates. And one of the um, invertebrates that we found in our 2018 surveys was the Comet Darner, which is a rare dragonfly that actually specializes in fishless habitats. So, you know, we knew we had some, some um, creatures here that needed some improved habitat. And interestingly, um, this swimming pool had trout in it because it was stocked for a um, student fishing tournament at one time, and some of them continued to survive being caught. So we also wanted to create a wet meadow habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. And since we have that sand from the beach, we wanted to provide some turtle and bee nesting habitat. And you can see over here on the right that we actually found some turtle shells next to the sandy area um, whenever we were doing our 2018 surveys. Next. So from 2018 to 2020, that's when we conducted our pre-survey site visits. We did our fundraising, our plan development, our permitting, and we, we started construction July 20 of 2020. Um, we needed some heavy equipment and experienced operators because this was um, going to be a project to get all this uh, cement out of here. So we wanted people who had done this before knew what they were doing. So the equipment we needed was um, this hydraulic hammer, a skid steer, and two different sizes of excavators. Um, and you can see we had to drill holes all the way around the outside of the pool so that the excavator could then break up the cement and remove it. Next. Um, the concrete was moved to the deepest end of the pool and covered with soil. So it, it helped us um, in a way that we were able to use it as fill. And we left the concrete on the bottom in place so that it could serve as artificial bedrock that would help maintain groundwater in the restored wetlands. 
it's just a real quick little time lapse that shows how we were moving that um, concrete from around the pool. So all in all, drilling, breaking up, and moving the concrete took about four days. So during this time, we sort of abandoned Bob in the pool and let him have at it. Um, we moved on to work on other parts of the project at different sites, which was part of the plan. And luckily, Bob brought enough staff and equipment to let us do that. Um, we then stockpiled our topsoil, our clay from the dam, and sand from the beach for later use. Next. This is just a, a video of Tom, a BB Kauser, explaining how we handled the core of clay from the dam. The excavator and the skid steer are being used to remove the dam for the swimming pool. The dam contained a core made out of clay so it wouldn't leak. What we're doing with the excavator and the skid steer is that we are taking this clay core, removing it, and stockpiling it. That clay will be used to line the wetland that we're going to build at the upper edge of the swimming pool. The soil that's low in clay will be used to form the wet meadow that will be located downhill from the wetland we're building. So once we removed all of that soil and clay, we shaped the wet meadow portion of the project and we used a very gentle slope of 4.5% in order to maintain sheet flow and prevent water from channeling in the meadow. Next. Then it came time to construct our pool and we took all of that clay, we spread it over the, the area where the pool was going to be constructed so that we could have a fairly even depth of clay. And then we dug the pool at different varying um, depths like Betsy had mentioned earlier. So we had some deeper parts and some shallow parts. Um, we lined it with clay and then spread topsoil over the surface and shaped pits and mounds to give it a more natural topography. Uh, added rock sticks and logs to provide added cover and places to perch and bask for the animals we hoped would use it. Next. This is the finished product. Doesn't look like much before the water is added, but there it is. And we'll move on. So now we have to add the water. And our original plan was to redirect the water from that spring fed channel that was to the left of the pond in that diagram over to the site in a sheet like pattern that would sort of snake around and get to the pond. Um, but during construction, there, was, there were several. Um, pretty severe storms that caused some rapid high water and erosion over in long run stream. So we were a little bit afraid that those types of events would either wash out our dam or cause the channel to redirect itself. So we decided to use the pipe that was already there that was buried underground that led to that bubbler. So once the bubbler was dismantled, we connected additional pipe ran it down into the fountain or into the bottom of the um, pool and tucked it in among some rocks so it wouldn't be visible and would allow the pool to fill from bottom up. Next. Here's another change in plan. Our original plan also was to allow the water to seep over the edges of the pool berm, so the, the dam on the lower end of the, the pool that we created, and then fan out into the wet meadow. But we had some concern again over channeling in that meadow. So we decided to create this gentle outflow instead that would snake around. You can see that sort of compacted area in the image here. And then the pool is back where you see the people standing. So that allowed it to sort of slow down, move around, and then feed out into the pool. Um, you know, everything looks really good on paper when you're doing these projects. But, you know, once you're at the site and you're under construction, Sometimes you just need to make changes or, or you even figure out maybe there's a better way. And that was the case here because what we were finding over in that spring channel were a lot of salamanders. And so this um, design here mimicked that channel and we were hoping it would actually add additional habitat for those salamanders. Next. So this is video from the drone that Betsy mentioned that we had used. Um, 
and it provides kind of a big picture of, of the project here. So the excavators that you're seeing, go ahead, Betsy, you can start, um, are using that rough and loosen technique to break up the compacted soils that were in the wet meadow. This leaves some pits, some mounds, some of those small little pocket pools that we were um, trying to add to the project. Um, you can see the vernal pool up in the sort of the center left. Yep, thanks, Betsy. And then the area that snakes around and empties out into the wetland. And then off to the left is where we replace the sand for the um, nesting area for turtles and insects. And we actually moved that to the opposite side of the pool from where it was originally located because it would be less likely to be bothered by um, access roads and just general traffic. Next. So after construction, we seeded the exposed areas in the meadow and around the edges of the wetland with some native upland and wetland mix, depending on the soils. Uh, we spread straw to prevent erosion and to stimulate seed growth. And then in September, we returned to plant some perennials and we picked plants that were native to Pennsylvania and specific um, to, to the region and appropriate for the conditions that we had. Um, one thing we learned here was that the rough and loosen technique looked fabulous when we first did it, but there was enough clay in the soil that it hardened quite a bit and um, nothing grew at first. So we reseeded, we were talking about, do we have to um, bring some soil in to, you know, um, add to the, make it a little easier for the native plants to get established. But as we discussed these options over time, it sort of took care of itself. and. Um, everything sort of settled out and fixed itself. So lesson learned here, be patient, give it a year or two to, to write itself. Next. So here's the final project from July, 2020 to this past October, 2022. Next. So by late August and early September, um, we had, this was, you know, of 2020, just a few weeks after we had green frogs and gray tree frogs, um, green frog tadpoles and gray tree frog metamorphs using the site. By April of 2021, we had American toads and spring peepers uh, breeding at the site. And we had some um, Eastern garter snake hatchlings that were found at the edge of the site. And then March of 2022, we had some wood frog um, egg masses that we found. So we've had an, a nice variety of animals utilizing the site. 